If you guys love Bad Day HQ, don't forget to check out Good Day HQ, available at youtube.com slash gooddayhq. It features the best in reality television, travel shows, and just general fun stuff to bring a smile to your day. The country of Sweden is well known for its high standard of living and modern liberal society. In the 1970s and 80s, it also gained a reputation as a safe haven for immigrants and refugees from around the world. Many settling in the capital of Stockholm. Uh, Stockholm was a growing city. I remember it as a nice town to live in. And you felt safe. We had quite uh, a lot of immigrants that had come. I think the general view was quite generous towards immigrants and asylum seekers. But the changing face of Sweden creates tensions as well. By 1990, racially motivated crimes are on the rise. Tensions soon take center stage following a series of violent, shocking attacks. August 2nd, 1991. A 21-year-old Eritrean immigrant named David Gebramarian is wheeled into a Stockholm hospital, bleeding profusely. He speaks to police and recounts a frightening, unprovoked attack. Earlier that evening, David exited a Stockholm subway station with two other young men. He was a student, and this particular night he was out with some friends, going out for having a good time. David pauses to light a cigarette when he notices a red light moving across nearby trees. And uh, suddenly, a friend to David saw this red spot on his clothing on the back side of his clothes. And they start to discuss, what, what is this? What is happening here? A few seconds later, they hear a gunshot and they all ran away from that place, and then he fell down. On the ground, David realizes he has been shot. Yeah, he was hit from behind, on the right side, just above his hip. The following morning, while David recovers in hospital, police search the area of the assault. They preserve the scene on film, and look for the bullet or a cartridge left behind by the attacker. Of course, we were there after and tried to find out where he could have been standing and search with metal detectors in the area. We never found anybody, any, anything, any traces from the shooting. In the lab, David's clothing is also examined for clues. We found out through looking through the clothing and the gunshot wounds he had, that this must be a small caliber a firearm. There was no exit hole in the clothing, and probably the bullet went through the hip, and it probably ended up in his pants. And when he ran through the subway station, or when he was taken care of by the ambulance, the bullet somewhere disappeared. So we don't have any kind of physical evidence from, from that crime scene. While police search for leads and interview friends of the victim, news of the bizarre shooting spreads. It was very much uh, written in the newspaper about this, uh, this murder attempt. The, 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 in the article they mention about this red point on his, on his body. Unable to find evidence or any reason why David was targeted, Police consider it a random, isolated event. October 21st, 1991. A 25-year-old student named Sharam Koshravi, a recent immigrant from Iran, leaves a local gym and heads into the night, walking alone. This was in the middle of a park, out in the student area. Uh, not very many people, except students, are moving on that path. Sharam Koshravi hears a noise in the bushes. He looks and is suddenly knocked down by a powerful shot to his jaw. A cyclist passing by finds him bleeding and in shock and quickly calls an ambulance. 
On his way to the hospital, Sharam feels what he believes is a shattered tooth in his mouth. It turns out to be the remnants of a bullet, which are quickly turned over to police. We received a plastic bag with, with bullet fragments. Uh, at least one of the pieces of the fragment was uh, of that size that you can measure the lands and the grooves. That was a 22 caliber bullet. That was pretty sure. October 27th, one week later, a homeless man named Dimitrios Karamalegos, originally from Greece, is preparing to spend the night outside when a man cycles past him in the dark. A few seconds later, the man reappears on foot, heading directly towards him. And he saw a red light uh, connecting to that person coming towards him. And uh, very short afterwards, two shots were fired that hit him in the belly area. Although wounded, Dimitrios runs to the nearby police station where he recounts his story and is driven to the hospital. His injuries are not life-threatening and he refuses any treatment beyond a dressing of his wounds. And he just walked out. He didn't want to go through the surgery. Hoping to learn the exact location where he was shot, police try to track Dimitrios down again for another interview. But with no fixed address to go off of, they are unsuccessful. Meanwhile, details of the shooting are soon being reported across the country, spreading more fear that a dangerous predator is behind all three attacks. I think the journalist thought of this as one guy before the police wanted to think about it as one guy. Heberson Vieira da Costa, originally from Brazil, is a musician living in Stockholm at the time. Uh, everybody was talking about it, you know, but at the time, it didn't know for sure that it was a guy uh, targeting immigrants. But um, we had that feeling that something like that could happen. A few days later, Heberson is busy setting up for an evening concert his band is scheduled to play when he notices an unusual figure behind the building. Uh, I went to the back garden of the place, was opening from the kitchen. And uh, I sat down on the stairs, uh, I lit a cigarette, I smoked at the time. And while I was sitting there, I saw this guy walking around in the, in, uh, the garden it looked really strange, you know, having a trench coat and a really strange hair. It looked like uh, a wig or something. Almost an hour later, Heberson is back inside when he feels he is not alone. And I kind of sensed some, somebody behind me. So I turned and looked. It was that guy I saw in the back garden. He had no expression at all, but I saw hate. I really, I really saw hate in his eyes. The man pulls something from inside his trench coat. So I saw at once it was a weapon, and I knew there was a laser sight. Uh, I remember everything I read before about this laser guy. I know there was him. I was cornered. I couldn't do anything. I knew I was going to get shot. I heard the three pops going after each other. Pop, pop, pop. Shot in both the jaw and the stomach, Heberson collapses. I started hurting really bad, you know. The head was kind of exploding. And I looked at the floor, I saw uh, blood. A blood pool getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And uh, I said, I'm in trouble here. Uh, I was certain I was gonna die at that time. I was scared, really scared. A friend in the next room hears Heberson's screams, rushes to his side, and then dashes off to call for help. He came back to me and started getting his clothes off and trying to put on the, the wounds and pressing it down. And uh, I was telling him, I'm gonna die here. 
By the time paramedics and police arrive, Heberson has lost close to three liters of blood. Although his jaw is shattered, he speaks briefly of his face-to-face -face encounter. And I told about the laser weapon, the, the laser sight. And they looked at each other, are you really sure? I said, yeah, I'm really sure. And uh, they took me away. I couldn't talk anymore. In a nearby hospital, doctors put Heberson under heavy sedation and struggle to save his life. Meanwhile, forensic expert Sone Bjork arrives at the crime scene. When we came, the place was uh, roped off, sealed. So we started the, the crime scene examination. So of course, we took photos of, of everything. And we could see that there was some blood on the floor. There were three cartridge cases inside, just inside the door. We, we recovered the, the cases. And we also recovered one bullet that, that was found on the scene. At the same time, other officers canvass the neighborhood. They soon find a woman who claims to have seen someone fleeing the building. And she told us about a man uh, who was wearing a light brown trench coat. And the man had uh, red hair and uh, wear glasses. With Heberson's life still hanging in the balance, the woman may be the only witness who can identify the shooter. Police bring in a sketch artist who helps bring her recent memory to life on the page. It reveals a man with red hair and rectangular steel-rimmed glasses. We got this picture of the man with the long red hair, very extreme red hair. I haven't seen such color on any person before. Meanwhile, news of another shooting spreads fresh fear across Stockholm. Many are now convinced that all of the shootings are the work of a single suspect who deliberately targets immigrants. A suspect now chillingly known in the media as Laser Man. November 1991. In Stockholm, Sweden, a mysterious suspect dubbed the Laser Man is believed to have shot four immigrants with a laser-guided rifle. His most recent victim, Heberson Vieira da Costa, remains unconscious in hospital for six days before police can finally meet with him again. When he couldn't talk, he was just so swollen and so had so such pain. Police show Heberson the composite sketch put together with the help of another witness from the scene. I was seeing him everywhere. In my dreams, in my family, everywhere. And then the police came in with the picture. And I said, everything is correct. It was really close to what I saw. While police debate making the sketch public, the bullet and cartridge cases found at the latest scene are examined by microscope at the National Forensic Laboratory. When you come to the cartridge cases, you just put them upside down with the bottom up and you put oblique light on the bottom of the cases and you compare the marks. By looking at both the firing pin and extractor marks left on the cases, Forensic experts determine that the bullets were likely fired from an Irma EM-1, a 22 caliber semi-automatic rifle. Beyond the likely model, they can also see the unique marks of the specific murder weapon itself, a kind of ballistic fingerprint, something that will allow them to identify it if they track it down. November 8th. Just one week after the shooting of Heberson Vieira da Costa, a 34-year-old Iranian man named Jimmy Ranjabar walks down the street. Jimmy has been living in Sweden with his common-law wife and two children for more than a decade. He was on the way to that student flat because he used that for studying. He tried to come in entrance in the, that building and uh, then it happens. A figure emerges from the shadows behind him and fires a single shot. Paramedics and police arrive and Jimmy is rushed to hospital. 
Detectives seal off the area and soon find a single cartridge case. News of yet another shooting spreads fast, reaching Heberson Vieira da Costa in his hospital bed. Uh, watching the news and I heard somebody got shot. And I knew it was him again. It was kind of an execution style shooting. It was a student. It was somebody trying to get a life from himself and his family. So I prayed the whole night that he would survive. But Jimmy Ranjubar's injuries prove too severe. He passes away during the night. And that's the first time I cried. Why did he die and I survived? He was a father and uh, I was single. Why did the, the kids have to grow up without a father? And I survived. And that really got to me and still gets to me. Esmail Zainali, a friend of Jimmy Ranjubar's, also learns the news. And I got a call from uh, the other guy, and he asked me, do you know what, what's happened? No, Jimmy is death. No, you're not, uh, it's not uh, right. Then it was something real for me. Laser man and my, my friends and his dad, I, I couldn't understand it. I was in some kind of a shock situation. And the panic really spread around in Stockholm. Not only does the laser man seem to be attacking more frequently, he is also closing in on his victims. And before I uh, got shot, uh, he took somebody from 20 meters and he didn't kill him. So he got closer. He still didn't kill him, but he got closer. And still didn't kill the guy. For me, it was two meters. He didn't kill me. So the next guy, he shot in the back of his head. It was obvious that he had failed to kill four times. And now he really did want to show what he really could do. And he killed this man. But this is a man who is he's hunting immigrants. While the public reels, an autopsy on Jimmy Ranjabar brings details to light. Sony Bjork is there to preserve the evidence on film. Yeah, I took pictures of during the autopsy. We assist the pathologist. We x-rayed the skull before the autopsy so we could see that the bullet was still inside his head. The bullet is removed and examined in the lab, along with the cartridge found on the scene. They point to the same type of 22 semi-automatic. Did that indicate that that was the same type of rifle that was used? It is the same firearm that was used to shoot Jimmy Rambor as it was on Hebe, Viera da Costa and Kushravi. Meanwhile, officers continue to search the area of the murder for more leads. We started to interview people right away, uh, canvassing the area. Hoping to generate fresh tips, they release the composite sketch of the suspect to the public. So people started to look and report to the police about all red-haired men they had seen. So many red-haired men were questioned about what they had done. At the same time, calls pour in from people claiming to have seen the laser man's unique calling card. You can say it was a bit hysteric at that time. Uh, we had uh, people calling, telling us we'd seen red light there, and we'd send patrols on every red light uh, that appeared. And uh, quite a lot of work it took us to investigate that. With pressure on police, the teams investigating the shootings grow in size, and detectives revisit earlier crime scenes. At the location where Sharam Koshravi was shot, an expanded search with metal detectors turns up another cartridge case, identical to the others found at different scenes. It adds another link in the chain of evidence connecting the crimes. The murder attempt against Koshravi and the murder attempt uh, against Heberson 
and the murder of Jimmy uh, Reinbar was connected. You could see that from the ballistics. But as the weeks pass, police find no concrete suspects. At the same time, the laser man seems to have disappeared. After committing three shootings in as many weeks, two whole months now pass without an incident. Curiously, at the very same time, police in Stockholm have another ongoing case involving a string of unsolved bank robberies that is also seemingly at a dead end. Some person did them by bicycle. He went to the bank, jumped over the desk, and uh, had a kind of rifle or some other kind of weapon, and got a lot of money. And that was a lot of talk about that. How can a guy on a bicycle get away with robbery? He just vanishes, and he wasn't caught. The shootings and the bank robberies will eventually be connected through a bizarre set of circumstances, but not before the infamous laser man returns, ratcheting up the pace of his brutal attacks. January 1992. In Sweden, four people have been wounded and one killed by a suspect now known as the laser man. A composite drawing reveals a possible likeness of the killer, a man who targets immigrants with the help of a laser-guided sight. Police pour through tips from a fearful public, but still have no concrete leads. We were focused to solve these crimes. It was uh, uh, 18 hours work every day. While police try to narrow their investigation, fears of more attacks are soon justified. January 22nd, in Uppsala, 70 kilometers north of Stockholm, Chilean-born Eric Bonkam Rudloff walks with his common-law wife when a masked man emerges from the dark. As Eric locks eyes with him, the man pulls out a handgun, fires once, then flees. Eric is rushed to hospital. Although he has been hit in the head, he survives. The recovered bullet turns out to be a 38 caliber fired from a handgun. But given the nature of the attack, police in Stockholm feel it is likely the work of the laser man, now hiding his face and using a more powerful weapon. We was informed the day after and uh, well, we said this must be, it must be the same. The following day, the suspect is on the move again. He's desperate to, to kill. He knew he had failed some 12, 13, 14 hours be before the, the victim had, had survived. Back in Stockholm, Charles de Klama, originally from Zimbabwe, gets out of his car and heads towards a store. The same masked man approaches and fires. I think that was three or four uh, rounds that were fired, and one of them hit him in the chest. He was not that bad injured and got help. Police find three 38 caliber bullets identical to the one recovered the day before. I looked at these bullets in the comparison microscope at that time. It had the same kind of impressions in, in, in the jacket and it was a, a soft point, flat nose, 38 caliber bullet. Same weight, same markers. at the one from Uppsala. Police also get what may be their biggest lead to date. Someone spotted the suspect making his getaway. There was this witness who sat in his car just after the shooting. And, and he saw this man with a mask, with a balaclava in the car and thought he saw a, ro a robber leaving the crime of the scene. He started to follow the, this white uh, Nissan Micra and they reported to the police and we got the license number. But the license number did not connect with the car. It was a stolen plate uh, going to uh, quite a different car. Before police can follow the tip further, the killer strikes again. That evening, 
He enters a club where immigrants from Somalia are socializing and playing cards. And they were sitting there, minding their business. And in through the door, there steps a man. He didn't say anything, he just pointed at them with a gun and fired. In the aftermath, only two men are wounded. I think both of them were hit in the head. And uh, miraculously, they didn't die. Police notice something strange at the scene. The 38 caliber bullets seem to be damaged, possibly from the barrel of the gun. There was some quite deep marks, not scratches, but deep impressions in the base of the bullet. And there was no explanation why this mark should be there. Although the suspect is using a more powerful weapon, unstable bullets likely saved the lives of his most recent victims. None of the bullets penetrated the skull of these two people that were shot. And apparently they hit the head broadside the bullet, so they, hit, they didn't hit with the point, because if, if they hit with the point, then probably it would have penetrated the skull. But they didn't in that case. Based on the description of witnesses, the problem may lie with some kind of alteration or attachment on the gun. They said that, that the firearms had something big black attached to it. So we was wondering if, if could that be a silencer? He, he was using a silencer on a revolver. That doesn't make sense because you can't silence a revolver because a lot of the noise comes through the gap between the cylinder and, and the barrel. As if confirming the bizarre theory, pieces of plastic found at the scene are consistent with the kind of plastic often used in 22 caliber rifle silencers. And if, if you have a 22 caliber silencer and you put the 38 bullet through it, it makes some damage inside the silencer. Meanwhile, after attacking three times in rapid succession, the gunman shows no sign of letting up. He enters a shop and fires at Isa Ibar, an immigrant from Turkey. Two days later, Hassan Satara, a Lebanese shop owner, is also shot at close range. Although both men survive, Hassan suffers permanent brain damage. In the span of a few months, the laser man has fired on 11 different victims, all of them immigrants. Every time somebody got shot, and I felt the feeling, you know, the anguish, everything kind of bubbling up again. And I couldn't breathe. I can't stand uh, watching somebody getting shot for nothing like that. Sorry. With the attacks now coming at a furious pace, an entire population is held hostage by the deranged gunman. So he didn't just shoot me, he shot a whole country. People didn't want to go to work. Even my Swedish friends had you know, darker hair and even them were scared. Everybody was scared. For police, the best lead to date involves the white Nissan Micra. Although the license plate number was a dead end, they compile a list of registered owners, a list thousands of names long. One Nissan Micra in particular will put them fresh on the trail of one of Sweden's most notorious criminals. February 1992. Swedish police are tracking one of the most violent criminals in the country's history. A suspect known only as the Laser Man has shot 11 immigrants in a terrifying crime spree. Fear and anger are widespread, while tensions in the capital city of Stockholm are approaching the breaking point. For police, the best lead to date remains a tip involving a white Nissan Micra, seen leaving the scene of one of the crimes. With few other options, they undertake the massive task of contacting all locals who own that model of car. This uh, information about the Nissan Micra, it was not easy to handle. There were about 12,000 white Nissan Micra registered in Sweden. While police interview owners and work their way down the long list, 
a forensic psychiatrist named Ulf Usgord is brought on board to help develop a criminal profile of the laser man, a relatively new technique in police circles. The general conclusion was that this is a strange man. He's not an ordinary man. It doesn't melt that easily into the community. Rigid uh, in his uh, thinking, uh, a loner, doesn't like confrontation, or almost certainly living alone. But after a rampage in late January, the laser man seems to be going through a cooling off period. No new attacks take place in the three months that follow. Another ongoing investigation involves a string of bank robberies committed by a suspect who escapes by bicycle. Although there seems to be no connection between these crimes and the laser man shootings, the robberies also stop during this same time period. Meanwhile, investigators find a Nissan Micra that piques their interest. The car was rented during the 24-hour period in January when three different shootings took place, one of them in Uppsala, 70 kilometers to the north. The odometer log shows that the man who rented the car put on enough mileage in that short period to have made the return trip. The man's name is John Ausonius. Police had seen the name a few years earlier, during the investigation into Swedish Prime Minister Olaf Palma's assassination. Although John Ausonius wasn't a suspect, he had once worked at a location near the assassination, so police had compiled information on his background. According to that file, 38-year-old John Ausonius was born Wolfgang Alexander Zaug, the son of German and Swiss immigrants, but changed his birth name in an attempt to conceal his immigrant background. He is also known to be antisocial, with strong prejudices against minorities. The information is soon shown to forensic psychiatrist Ulf Usgord. And in this file, you could find all the traits a loner, a strange man, a man uh, changing names. He fit uh, the offender profile as a hand in a glove. But beyond fitting the profile and having rented a white Nissan Micra during a key time frame, no evidence ties Ausonius to the recent crimes. Nor does he look like the composite drawing of the shooter. Police, however, are determined to follow up on the lead but they have trouble tracking his whereabouts. He has no fixed address, using only a post office box for his mail. And he appears to be out of the city as the mail is piling up. Police also check video store membership lists, a common device used to track down the residence of a potential suspect. We were looking up all possible uh, places where he could uh, do business and so on. And there we came to uh, this video shop where we found his name. Although Alsonius has not rented a video in a few months, the owner of the store is instructed to contact police should the account become active. In the meantime, an amazing discovery on the outskirts of Stockholm brings new evidence to light. 65-year-old Berthil Engzel prepares to fish for herring off a bridge, first dropping his line into the water to test the depth. He put the lid, put the hooks in the bottom, tried and started to rewind a little bit, then he felt something on the hook. And then he felt there was something that's quite heavy. And he pulled it up and on, 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 the, on that bridge there was this 38 caliber revolver in a holster. The fisherman takes the waterlogged weapon to a nearby police station where they noticed it has been modified. An unusual looking adapter has been threaded on it at the end. It is soon in the hands of forensic expert Sone Bjork. When I took the revolver out from the holster, I, I mean, I immediately understood that this must be the revolver that has been used for the five shootings that occurred uh, in January that year. 
and it was quite of an experience, I can tell you. I mean, that's one of the most fantastic things I ever experienced. Test firings confirm that it is indeed the 38 caliber firearm used in the most recent wave of shootings. By an incredible stroke of luck, police have found a key piece of evidence. The odds of the discovery seem so unlikely, suspicion is briefly cast on the fisherman who found it. It's too fantastic that somebody shoots six foreigners in Stockholm, dump the revolver from a bridge, and somebody is, is getting it up fishing in the area. And we interview witnesses who have been out on this bridge. They supported Mr. Engstel's story. But the odds, I think uh, it's one to one billion to, su to succeed with this again. Although police now have a weapon linked to some of the crimes, they have no way to tie it to their latest person of interest, John Ausonius. Nor do they know where he is. That is, until June 10th, 1992, when he suddenly reappears at the video store they have been watching. He leaves by bicycle, for officers in tow. It is their very first sighting of the prime suspect in the Laser Man shootings. The tactics uh, wa was to uh, put uh, Ausunas under surveillance because the evidence against him was not so good. In the days that follow, another crime and an amazing set of circumstances break the entire case wide open. June 1992. In Sweden, police have 38-year-old John Ausonius under surveillance. Although they lack hard evidence, they feel he may be the infamous Laser Man, a figure who has targeted immigrants in a series of shootings that have gripped the country. It isn't long before their prime suspect makes a series of moves that blow the investigation wide open. June 12th, 10 a.m. John Ausonius leaves his apartment wearing a suit and carrying a briefcase. He heads off by bicycle with undercover police close behind. This particular morning, they followed him in the city of Stockholm and he went through the city and there he disappeared. He left his bicycle and disappeared. And the surveillance personnel just stood there wondering where did he go. Minutes later, an officer spots Ausonius again, though strangely, he has changed out of his suit and is now wearing gym clothes. Slipping in and out of sight, he eventually heads into a bank. A minute later, he bursts back out, removing a mask. John Ausonius has just robbed a bank right in front of police. An officer tries to stop him, but Ausonius fires a shot and rushes off. Police return to where they had lost sight of him earlier, presumably the spot where he changed clothing. They see him leaving a building, once again in his suit and tie. He was arrested right the way outside uh, with his briefcase, and in the briefcase there was the money from the bank robber. He was completely surprised. He didn't uh, understand that he was put uh, under surveillance at all. Along with being a prime suspect in the Laser Man shootings, John Ausonius also appears to be the bicycle bank robber that plagued the city over the previous year. And there we had him. We were happy, we were cheering, I remember. The arrest allows police to search his apartment for more evidence connecting him to the other crimes. It isn't long before they find what they're looking for. Red hair dye is discovered at his place, along with rectangular steel-rimmed eyeglasses, the makings of a disguise for the man pictured in the composite drawing released to the public. Most damning is the growing firearm-related evidence. In the lab, police are able to use a chemical treatment to recover the serial number on the 38 revolver found by the fisherman a few weeks earlier. It is traced to a store in South Africa, purchased on a trip by one John Ausonius. 
Furthermore, the bizarre adapter on the end of the 38 turns out to be the tip of a 22 semi-automatic rifle, identical to the kind used in the first five shootings. Nicks on the adapter have clearly been made by a metal vise owned by Ausonius, proving that he himself modified the weapon, a weapon that links both series of shootings. Every piece is, was falling on its place, so and we were quite sure that we have him, so to speak. News that the laser man is in custody spreads relief throughout a country traumatized by the shootings. This is the laser man, and he's finally caught good. It was a, a relief, very much so. Yet despite the evidence piled up against him, Ausonius maintains his innocence. He wants to control his own defense, changing lawyers and delaying his trial. He had had six lawyers before us in the same case, and uh, at least two of them he had uh, abused in a way that he had uh, hit them. Everything that we were going to say in the court, he wanted to uh, look it through with us. On September 1st, 1993, John Ausonius finally stands trial. Along with the strong evidence against him, some of the laser man's victims identify him in court, including Heberson Vieira da Costa. My lawyer asked, who is him? And I looked at him and pointed at him, him. And I could see those eyes again. If looks could kill, but I just looked back. I knew you couldn't hurt me anymore. The conclusion was that uh, this man is suffering from a personality disorder. He was a narcissistic person. He had uh, very high beliefs in his own uh, abilities. So he didn't like the immigrants. Uh, there were too many immigrants in Sweden. He was a sick man, ill man. In between robbing banks and shooting at immigrants, John Ausonius traveled overseas, nursing a gambling addiction as well as a fondness for hunting large game. Well, he bought most of the weapons in South Africa. And he also had um, pictures of animals killed there. In April of 1995, John Ausonius is sentenced to life in prison for his crimes as both the laser man and the bicycle bank robber. Justice offers some closure to a painful chapter in Swedish history, one that threatened the very social fabric of the country. I was happy. Happy as hell. It's over. In 2000, John Ausonius finally confessed to his crimes, claiming his racially motivated shooting spree was meant to scare foreigners away from Sweden. The story of the laser man is a story that I think immigrants tell their children and their grandchildren. One murder, ten murder attempts, about 20 bank robberies. So I think uh, as soon as he will be in prison a long time. If you guys are preparing for the apocalypse or want to survive a disaster or just want to have a really awesome camping trip, check out the products we have in the links below. Just by shopping for these products, you help support Bad Day HQ. In fact, any shopping you do in Amazon while going through these links will actually help us produce more great content for you guys.